right, it's seven o'clock. Um, so we will go ahead and, uh, and bring to order the uh, Tuesday, August 25th, uh, electronic school board work session and closed meeting. Um, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining and for those watching. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we are meeting under the uh, terms of the emergency ordinance adopted by uh, city council on April 6th, which allows the school board to meet electronically in order to address continuity of operations associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. And that our electronic meetings are still open to the public. Uh, there will be an opportunity for the public to submit public comments to be read at the meeting and all meeting notices will be posted on the FCCPS website with the agendas available in advance on board docs. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, ask Ms. Godella to call the roll. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson? Here. Dr. Dimmick? Here. Ms. Downs? Here. Ms. Litton? Here. Mr. Reitinger? Here. Ms. Russell? Here. And Mr. Webb? No. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Will you all please rise and join me for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. I would seek a motion regarding tonight's agenda. And I move that we adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. And no, Mr. Webb. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as we begin tonight's meeting, before we get to public comment, I just want to take a brief moment to note that uh, Betty Blystone, who is a former school board chair and uh, city council member passed away on Saturday, August 8th. And it just, uh, she had such a long service career for the community that I wanted just to note. Uh, she served as uh, on the school board for 12 years, including the chair as for three years and as president of the Virginia School Board Association back in 1980 and served on the city council for, uh, for six years, including a term as vice mayor and a term as mayor. Uh, and as a 50 year member of the League of Women Voters and a past president of the League of Women Voters here in Falls Church. So um, just want to just want to acknowledge that uh, that Betty passed and, and just say that our, our condolences go out to her family uh, and those who knew her. So, um, so thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, Ms. Goodell, public comment. I think we're moving on to 2.01. And I'll just say, while the state of, state of emergency remains in effect due to COVID-19, uh, written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members. Public comments will be read into the record for a period of 30 minutes or until all submitted comments are read, whichever comes first. And in accordance with school board policy BDDH, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Please send written statements to school board clerk Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org. And note that public comments received by 10 a.m. on the day of the meeting will be posted on board docs prior to the meeting. Oh, Ms. Goodell. Uh, yes, so we have two comments for tonight. The first is uh, from Angie Mellon, let's get sports practices going. Dear school board members, Dr. Noonan, Mr. Hills, and Mr. Wooten, we respectfully request that George Mason High School athletic practices are allowed to restart immediately with in-person practices using the COVID-19 guidelines. Athletics provide many benefits to our students that can safely be achieved through the start of practices. Athletics provide for good physical health as well as improved social, emotional, and teamwork skills. Kids learn to communicate, goal set, problem solve, and how to follow rules. Many of the comorbidities that cause serious COVID-19 complications, obesity, heart disease, and diabetes can be attributed to a non-active lifestyle. Thus, athletics can help to prevent these comorbidities from developing in our students, especially since they will be on the screen for more, many more hours a day and less active during the school day, i.e. no changing classes, walking home after school, going to the bus stop, or competing in sports. Many of our students have been put in an equitable situation because we haven't begun sport practices. Many schools in our district started practicing in June. 
Additionally, most club travel teams in our area, i.e. Fairfax County and Arlington County, have started practices, scrimmages, and even tournaments in sports, including high-risk sports like lacrosse and soccer. Kids that either cannot afford to participate on those club travel teams or students that don't have an equivalent club team in their sports suffer. Also, many private high schools are planning a fall season in low-risk sports, i.e. tennis, golf, and cross-country in the Northern Virginia area. Our family is currently affected by the fact that there are no youth high school cross-country teams to join locally, and students cannot compete in fall invitationals without being officially attached to a club or a high school. We request that FCCPS allow our uh, cross-country coaches to sign up runners who want to compete, knowing the parents would cover all the costs, liabilities, and logistics. High school kids across the country are currently competing and getting times for recruiters, while our students are forced to sit and watch since they cannot sign up for the invitationals on their own. This has taken a huge emotional toll on the rising junior and seniors who want to run in college and have worked so hard but cannot compete in official events, i.e. chipped milestad events. We understand BHSL currently restricts competition, but FCCPS can allow practices to occur. FCCPS should not add restrictions to our student athletes any more than BHSL does once competitions resume in December. We are confident that parents will help make the logistics, i.e. transportation, et cetera, of sports competitions work once they are allowed to move forward and believe that many parents would sign a legal waiver for COVID-19 if that is a stumbling block, as that is the, what many of the club travel teams are currently doing. FCCPS is a unique small school system and should be able to get should be able to be nimble and creative, unlike our huge neighbors, Fairfax County Public Schools, Arlington Public Schools, and Loudoun County Public Schools. Thanks for your consideration, and let's get our kids back on the practicing field ASAP. Oh, that's three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next comment was from the Athletic Boosters Board to the school board. First off, we are very excited that the new school year is finally upon us. We know how hard the superintendent and his staff, our school board, and our wonderful teachers have been working to get ready for the new year. We are writing to you to applaud the return of athletics at George Mason High School. We believe that the return of athletics plays an integral part role in a successful start of the new school year for our student athletes, allowing our Mason teams to work on fitness and conditioning, individual skill work, and ultimately to hold team practices pursuant to the safety guidelines issued by VHSL is crucial to addressing the social emotional needs of our students. There is simply no substitute for the camar camaraderie of being with coaches and teammates. In addition, having consistent practices schedules with physical activity among teammates can help ease the anxiety that many of our children face during these uncertain times. As most of you are probably aware, travel sports teams throughout the area are already practicing and in some cases competing. But the overwhelming majority of our student athletes do not play on these kinds of teams and do not have this opportunity. While the return of Mason Athletics, we further the equity goals of our school district and community by offering the same opportunity to all of our students, varsity athletes, JV athletes, those who want to play college sports, those that just want to make one of our teams. As athletic boosters, our organization works hard to ensure that athletic opportunity is available to everyone, not just those who can afford to play on an expensive travel team. Furthermore, we are confident that our coaching staff can supervise our student athletes in complying with Mason expectations and VHSL safety guidelines during our practices. Our goals for this year for Mason athletics are twofold. First, we wanna get our athletes back out on the field immediately to support their social emotional wellness as they continue to adjust to the constraints placed upon them by the pandemic. Team workouts are already on the schedule for the beginning of the first week of September, and for that we are grateful. Second, with the modified VHSL season beginning in mid-December, we want our teams to be ready for the interscholastic competition at the highest levels. Our schedule will be limited to contests against the district opponents, primarily the Northwestern District for most of our sports. The schools in our district have been practicing in some form or another since the summer. We look forward to doing the same. Finally, our organization stands ready to assist the athletic department during this difficult time. We have thoroughly enjoyed working with Coach Wooten and Coach Trebles in getting this very unique new year started. And that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cadell, and, and thank you for the, the comments. Um, again, a reminder that uh, you can always send your public comments to our school board clerk uh, Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org. And we read every single one of the comments and listen very carefully to every single one of the comments we get. So um, 
I'd like to move on now to, to item 3.01, which is um, kind of a fun, uh, a fun thing we get to do at the start of the new school year. So um, we actually have an opportunity to, uh, to welcome our students back a little graphically, to, a little graphically, a little pictorially tonight. And Ms. Goodell, I, I don't know if, uh, if we're ready for folks to just uh, show their cards, as it were. What do you think? I think so. And I think Mr. Brett's going to take a photo. All right, everyone, please hold up your signs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brett, for taking the picture. And I should give credit to the artist. We're done. We're credit due to the artist. Uh, this is done by my kid, Sign Anderson, and I'm nowhere near the artist that they are. So, anyway, and mine by Betsy. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Brett, for taking the photo for us. And um, Ms. Goodell, that goes to VSBA for their sort of larger yeah. campaign, but also I am. Assuming we will see it very shortly out on our uh, social media feeds as well. So thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right, and now we'll move on to uh, to the first business in action uh, before us tonight, which is a school board advisory committee charges uh, conversation here or discussion in our in our meeting. A little bit of context on this one, of course, is um, we have several advisory committees that are there to help the board and the division. Um, understand the needs of our community a little better, give us advice on how we can do, uh, do the business of the division better. Uh, and in particular, give the board advice on questions that, um, that we think we need to, to get advice on and that we wanna have understanding of. Um, several of us have, have had different roles on those advisory committees over the years. Um, and certainly we're all liaisons to at least one or two of them. Um, this year, the, the thought was that um, we should take a little time at the beginning of the new school year to give some thought to what questions we on the board would particularly like input from our advisory committees about. Um, certainly there are things that they do every year and that's what their charters are for. Um, and certainly there are things that the committees themselves are interested in carrying forward, but also questions that, that we um, would like to, to see addressed and get input on. Um, so we put this on the agenda for a work session discussion so that we can have a conversation about what those questions might, might look like, uh, what sorts of topics we're interested in with the idea that if we come to an agreement on a set, then at our meeting on the 8th of September, we'd be poised to take an action and, and actually uh, put those forward in some final, final form out to the individual committees uh, to go forward. And Dr. Noonan has worked with uh, staff, worked with all of the staff liaisons for each of the committees to come up with a few um, beginning charges for a discussion point um, that are tied to our triennial plan, to our three goals, and to, well, responding to the, the uh, global pandemic. So uh, at this point, I don't know, Dr. Noonan, would you like to, to carry it forward from there? Sure, thank you, Jerry Anderson. Um, Good evening, everybody. It's really great to see all of you. Um, I would just sort of um, carry on what uh, Dr. Anderson was saying um, to one, um, say that in, in, um, this in no way is meant to uh, curtail any of the work that any of the um, board uh, committees have done in the past. Um, I just happen to have, I personally have had experience with board committees uh, where they were given charges uh, at the beginning of the year to really look at, to think through that um, really would then help advise ultimately the school board on whether it's policy, whether it's budgetary uh, decision-making and the like. And I think currently, uh, at least best I can tell is that our advisory committees do amazing work and, they, um, and you all meet with them on a very routine basis and you come back and you share the information with the rest of the school board about what the advisory committee has been talking about, but I'm not sure that always it's as cohesive perhaps as it could be with respect to our school board goals. Um, and so, so tonight what I thought I would do is um, share with you just some of the current thinking um, that some of the staff liaisons brought forward. Uh, and my, char my charge for the staff liaisons, frankly, uh, last week was to think about those committees that you currently work with and how might um, you think about a charge that connects to whether it's IB or closing the gap or a caring community and culture um, or how might some of the work of your committee really work to support us through the work we're doing specifically in equity and racial justice 
or is there something that your committee would be interested in doing or that you could think of that would connect specifically to um, being in a global pandemic? So those liaisons um, from the staff, and some of them are on here tonight, for example, Rebecca Sharp is the liaison to the Special Ed Advisory Committee, um, went back and, and worked with uh, their teams and kind of thought about what a charge might be. And I, I'd like to just share with you what their thinking was, um, not in a lot of detail, but just sort of as a high level um, idea, because at the end of the day, these are obviously your charges as school board members. You get to ask what you want to ask of these committees. Uh, or not ask of these committees. We were just thinking if there were some way to, again, continue to try and build this cohesive uh, environment to work within to support all of our goals and the work that we're doing, it might be, it might be valuable. So the first group that um, I, I talked to was Mary Beth um, Connolly, and Mary Beth is the staff liaison to the BIE. And when she met with the BIE, um, just at a very, again, a very high level, um, she was talking about the Business Education Partnership Committee. Um, their charge would be to continue to build around partnerships between schools and businesses and nonprofit organizations. But specifically due to COVID-19 in our community, building those um, connections are, are more important than ever. But um, what was interesting about the twist that she took following that was, um, again, part of the charge for BIE could be um, tasking that team with helping expand opportunities for minority owned businesses to participate in FCCPS programs. So when we think about the work that they do in terms of growing the, the, those regional partnerships or, or partnerships within the city, um, the idea of very specifically working with minority owned um, really speaks to some of our work around equity. So, so that was the BIE. Um, the second one was ESOL and this was Dr. Jennifer Santiago. Um, and Dr. Santiago said um, that she was thinking the, the ESOL advisory could work to develop ways for families who speak languages other than English to be more included in family engagement opportunities. So when we think about a caring community and a caring climate. So during the time of COVID-19, it's uh, more important than ever for our language minority families and ESOL families to be directly communicated with and being able to communicate successfully between the school and division employees so that they can actively access and participate in all activities. So transitioning a model of family engagement at, at our school level would be something that she was very interested in having um, the, the ESOL advisory committee looking at. So, so first for that caring community, but also for closing gaps. And that's sort of how the work that she put forward connected. Uh, with respect to gifted education, um, and this was Jeannie Seabridge, um, ultimately, what she um, thought would be a good charge for the Gifted uh, Education Advisory Committee would be looking specifically at and providing input on how to monitor the success of the talent pool from an equitable identification process. In other words, looking at it with a lens of equity. So as we bring students in and they're being identified for gifted and talented services, are we doing that? with a lens of equity, and if not, how might we be able to um, look at our current identification process to create more opportunities to be equitable, specifically to uh, traditionally underrepresented populations in the uh, advanced academic program. In special education, um, again, this was uh, Rebecca Sharp, um, taking on the charge of supporting families um, of students of special education, as well as staff to helping navigate this year um, specifically looking at through the lens of COVID-19 at the different potential models of instruction, whether it's 100% in-person, hybrid, or virtual. Um, but that, that committee would really focus some of their energy on helping us sort of crack the code for how can we um, more fully work through some of the challenges that we're facing to bring back potentially some of our special education students and if we can't bring back our special education students because of the data, how do we more fully support um, IEP goals through our either hybrid or online process? Um, and then DeCab or the Daycare Advisory Board, and this is Katie Clinton. Um, Katie said that she uh, would like for, for their board to consider uh, continuing to monitor all of the aspects of the extended day program, specifically due to the virtual learning uh, program that we're in 
and look at tracking um, program staffing, budget fees, and uh, eligibility to begin looking at equity with respect to policies and procedures and goals for identifying and provo promoting the most equitable practices as possible. So really trying to figure out how could we look at the daycare group through, again, a more equitable lens? Is there a way to be more inclusive than perhaps we have been in the past with respect to our, our daycare program? So, um, so those, are how, those were some of the musings, um, some of the thinking that went into um, the charges that our staff thought might be useful and would tie back specifically to our work around equity, around COVID-19, around gap closing, uh, and also the caring community and culture. So um, I, I'm not sure how much more you would like me to go on. Uh, Dr. Anderson, I presume that's probably as far as you want me to go, um, but I, I wanted to put those out there for the board to consider as you uh, engage in your conversation about charges for um, for your committees. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Uh, that's, it's very helpful to have the, the staff have given thought to this as a place for us to begin a conversation. Um, and so at this point, uh, I really sort of want to open it up to the board. Um, and of course, Ms. Snyder, that includes you in this conversation, please. Um, but um, to make comments, to have a discussion about this, I suppose fundamentally the first question is, is everyone comfortable with the idea of actually giving charges in some sense? Um, but then also other thoughts that others have. So please, um, I can either call on folks or we can just open it up for anybody who wants to. Ms. Downs. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and thank you, Dr. Noonan. Uh, I'm, I think have giving the advisory committees a charge is a great idea. I, granted, I was just sworn in in January, and we didn't really have a chance to meet before um, COVID hit. So I don't have a lot of experience on the ground with advisory committees. Um, I guess this question's for Dr. Noonan. Uh, I am the liaison with the um, ESOL community, uh, committee, and I don't know if this is a charge, but we do have on that committee several vacancies. And it's my understanding we don't have any ESOL families on that committee. And so, and, and I, I, my, I had a brief discussion with Dr. Santiago and understood that we also, um, the student rep over the years has never, has not been an ESOL student, a language learning student. So I didn't know if that could maybe be part of the charges um, really working to recruit um, as many useful families or parents as we can to be on that committee, as well as having a student who is an English language learner uh, student rep on that committee. So I, I didn't know if that's necessarily a charge, but I just thought it was an interesting point to bring up. So I, I think that's a great point. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily a charge from the perspective of these advisories exist to advise you. Um, but I think what we could do is talk with Jen, and I know that William has already been talking to her um, as part of the Equity DLT, uh, the division leadership team as well, to uh, really crack sort of that nut, if you will. Um, one of the really beautiful outgrowths of the Family Resource Center a couple of years ago was that we now have sort of a, a um, Family Resource Center advisory board, which is a sole and separate committee, um, of the, not of the board, but just that takes care of the FRC. Um, and, and the families that are part of that FRC have kids in our school. And there was one, in, one young person in particular who is very um, uh, interested in talking about his experience in ESOL and um, perhaps we could actually go to that young person and see if he'd be interested, but we, we definitely can do some recruiting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, other comments and thoughts? Dr. Dimmick. Um, so I'm also new to the school board, um, but I like the idea of a charge. Um, it, it, you know, there would be some, it, it seems that what the staff came up with, there are sort of unifying themes in there because they're the themes of our, of our sort of mission and plan and, and having, um, having the committees work in a unified way could be helpful to us. Um, I, I guess only one concern I have is if people joined these committees with the idea that I'm going to be engaged in this and I'm going to work on this and we're excited to do these things, like if they already have things that they sort of joined that committee to do, but I don't know if that's actually the, the case. 
Um, but I like the idea of a chart. Thank you, Dr. Demick. Yeah, I mean, my reaction on that would be that, of course, um, there are the committees have things that they do on an ongoing basis anyway. Um, this isn't necessarily an exclusive thing, but this is something that we could say we were interested in. But yeah, I think that's a valid point that you're raising. Other comments from others? Ms. Linton. Um, thanks, Chair Anderson. I mean, I, I guess having been on a committee just from being in office for one term, um, I think this would be helpful. I think like Sue said, you know, that there are things sometimes these committees want to do, but I, at least when I was on one, it felt a bit like we got to the beginning of the year and people were sort of like, oh, what are we supposed to do? What should we do? So, you know, I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful to the committee when they get to the end of the year and they have to do their report, you know, it would make sense for that to be something they kind of report back to us on. Um, you know, it doesn't mean they shouldn't still do the activities they want to do, but, you know, as a board for the committee, um, I mean, a committee for the board, I just think it makes sense for us to have an ask for them. So, I, yeah, I like it. And I think seems like the staff did a great job coming up with some recommendations. I don't really have any changes to make to those. They sound good to me. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Other comments? In, in the absence of a hand, I, I can say one of the other things building, I think, is letting on what you were just talking about. One of the things I found as a board member coming in, um, knowing what the questions that, that the rest of the board really wanted, uh, wanted the committee to work on was something that um, would have helped me at the very beginning of my time on the, uh, as a liaison on one of the, the members, uh, sorry, on one of the committees. And it took me a while to realize that um, I didn't really have a good sense of that. And so I, that would be helpful, I think, to, to have it uh, as, as it starts. Ms. Snyder. Yeah, I would agree with what Chair Anderson said. I served as the student representative to the Gifted and Talented Committee a couple of years ago. And I would say that having the charges would probably be really helpful, especially right now, as we have such clear goals for the year with regard to equity and remote learning. And I think that just having these clear charges set out for the advisory committees would really help them to best advise the board. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Uh, Ms. Russell. I um, mean, yeah, so I just wanted to, I guess, tag on to what Ms. Snyder and Ms. Linton said that I think that having the charges um, would be extremely helpful to the advisory committees because I think it would also help unify um, the board and the committees in terms of, I guess, mission and vision. And obviously, Dr. Noonan and staff have put a lot of thought into um, you know, our three pillars, I guess, and the focus of the schools. And so I think that the advisory committee should track to that. Um, obviously, you know, expanding on it if need be, um, but I think that you know, it's something that, I guess the charge should be kind of pushed down to the advisory committees and the advisory committees are then pushing back up the feedback and the work based on you know, again, the, the mission and vision that we have as a division. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Uh, any other comments? So far, I'm hearing general support for the idea and, and not um, any major suggestions for changes from the initial, uh, initial uh, staff work, but um, still open for other comments. Uh, Mr. Reitinger. <clears throat> so I, I also support the notion of there being um, a charge. I would not suggest that it should be you know, <clears throat> exclusive. I think there needs to be an opportunity for the advisory committees to, in a distributed way, come up with ideas that are perhaps outside of what we have considered. Um, but I think charges in my terms on the board are helpful to advisory committees. Um, I don't know if you wanted to engage in a line in line out set of edits on the charges themselves. I certainly have at least one comment. And if I spend a little bit more time reviewing them, I might have more. 
Um, is it the chair's plan to approve the charges tonight or at the next meeting? At the next meeting, not tonight. Um, then perhaps I could suggest we follow a process where we suggest comments, if any, and comments to the chair and present a revised draft to the board at the next meeting. I'm happy with that. If folks want, uh, Dr. Newton's got his hand up. I, I appreciate that. Thanks very much. I, I think we want to um, get the, the charges right. So uh, what you saw tonight is kind of a, a draft and one of them is particularly long. So um, if it would be useful, maybe we could clean them up a little bit before and resend them back out. Um, and then you guys, you all as a board could send your comments based on a more cleaned up draft, if that's okay. Mr. Reitinger. So uh, I certainly think that's fine. Um, since you're going to be doing that, Dr. Noonan, um, I'll offer one suggestion, um, which is I, I was paying particular attention to the health and wellness advisory committee charge since that is my uh, new assignment. And one of the things I noticed is I think the charge could go a little bit farther. It talks about informing the community about health and wellness issues due to COVID-19. But I think the committee should be looking specifically at changes to school programs and policies, particularly around additional stress on students. I think we know that both staff and students are gonna be undergoing um, significantly higher levels of stress um, this year. Um, perhaps, and we could ask Ms. Snyder about this for um, the seniors who are getting ready to go off to college and not really knowing what all of this means. Um, I'd also suggest that um, there are some things about the educational environment now that need to be considered. Um, in particular, all of the education is taking place at a distance, which gives staff less opportunity to observe challenges. And I worry in particular about things like cyberbullying, <clears throat> because that may be something that would occur outside the purview of staff where you would um, have more of a chance to observe the analogs of that if there was a physical environment. So um, that is something I think the uh, Health and Wellness um, Advisory Committee should consider and advise the board on and whether there need to be any changes in policy based on those sorts of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reininger. Um, I was taking notes as well. Uh, and Ms. Downs, I think I saw your hand at uh, one point really quickly. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, uh, other comments, I see Ms. Snyder, go ahead. Yes, um, to Mr. Redinger's point, I think student stress is definitely increasing. Um, right now, it's the start of school, so we're doing the slow rollout, and I think everyone isn't too stressed just because we're still getting used to it. But as the year does go on, I think it would be helpful for the health and wellness committee to really dig into ways to kind of alleviate student stress and to provide them with more opportunities to, I don't know, promote wellness and just really take care of themselves. Because of course, our priority is to learn right now, but we also have to stay healthy for just the rest of our lives. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Um, Ms. Russell. So I guess now to saddle the health and wellness committee with too big of a charge, um, but I guess I'm just thinking to some of the letters that we heard during public comment, um, specifically um, Ms. Mellon's letter about the importance of, I guess, physical activity and you know the situation that we find ourselves in sitting in front of the computer I guess we meaning the students um, for an extended period of time and they're not walking between classes and to school and so I think that it would be wonderful if the health and wellness committee could also um, I guess under the COVID umbrella uh, promote some sort of physical fitness physical activity just making sure that um, kids are getting outside or at least doing something active since there's just so much sitting in front of screens now. So that would be wonderful if we could add that on there. Could end up being a big charge, but we will certainly work with uh, Dr. Sale Meyer and uh, figure out how to navigate this. So thanks. Thank you. Are there other comments from anyone?
All right, are there any other comments on any of the other charges? Um, we've had a lot on the health and wellness and I think that's people are picking up on a common theme there. Um, Dr. Dimmick. Um, it, it isn't a specific comment on, the, on, on a charge, but it does seem that there is, for a number of them, a sort of a unifying theme around communications. And I think when I was thinking of charges and sort of leading up to this meeting, that was one that really resonated with me because we are in this different time and we we're all, all having, you know, teachers and students have a different relationship. Teachers, um, parents and um, the schools have a very different relationship. And so it's, it's communication is really important and, you know, Sometimes we nail the communication and people seem to know what's going on at other times, people are really confused. So I guess one of the things that I would like to see the committees help us with is, is to better understand like um, how to reach their populations. And if we, if we aren't reaching those populations well, what do we need to be doing to reach those populations? Yeah, I was just scribbling down a note more in some sense, how to communicate, uh, lean, lean a bit on the committees to give us advice on how better to communicate the issue the committee is interested, the issues the committee are working on to what's their space to the groups that are, have a strong interest in that. Is that a sort of um, a Not just that, but also to, to how do we make sure we are reaching the, are we effectively reaching the ESOL community? Are we effectively reaching the um, special ed community with our communications? Do, you know, do, do the, the, it seems to me the advantage of these committees for us is that it is, it's a place where we can get feedback from members of our community. Um, granted, these are maybe our more engaged members of our community, but if we're missing in our communication with this group, that would signal that we're missing with our communications more broadly. And I do think that, you know, for better or worse, parents are taking more ownership of education these days and, and some want more information, some want maybe less information, but it would be good to know, um, you know, to, to sort of rethink these partnerships a bit because it isn't the old model where the kid got on the bus and off to school they went. Um, so it is a, it's a different kind of partnership. Thank you. Um, all right, any other, uh, any other thoughts on this one? Otherwise, I think, I think we're uh, coming to the end of this conversation. All right, so not seeing any. So then, Dr. Noonan, I think if, if the staff liaisons can give a little bit of refinement to, to the draft, and then um, the board would like to take that back up. And uh, if everything is in order, I think we'd be taking action on September 8th at our next meeting. And perhaps uh, if you can you know, distribute the, the refined version, and then we can gather comments uh, to, to be ready for the 8th. OK. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we'll now move on to our next uh, business and action item um, for, uh, for tonight, uh, which is uh, going back to our very colorful signs and a welcome back, a first day of school report and, and how things are going the first now two days of school. So Dr. Noonan. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jerry Anderson. Um, I, you know, I, I uh, I almost feel like I should just ask Elizabeth, like, how, how did it go, Miss Snyder? <laughs> did you have a great day today and yesterday? Maybe I you could really maybe you could lead it. us off. Um, I thought that things went really smoothly. Um, just kind of starting off slow yesterday at the middle school and the high school, everyone just had their first two classes. And so we got used to using the technology again. Um, we really emphasized the emphasis on sorry, emphasize um, how we're all going to be participating actively in learning this year, which I think is something that's shifted a little bit from last year because of course we were involved, but now there's just so much more synchronous learning. Um, so the past couple of days have been going really well. 
students who I've talked to have really enjoyed it and they've found it to be really helpful to hear from their teachers what the expectations are and really outlining what they're going to be doing this year. So I think we're off to a great start. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for letting me put you on the spot this evening. So um, Ms. Michael, if you can allow me to share my screen, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share a presentation that we did put together. Um, and I wanna thank uh, John particularly for his help in um, pulling some of this data and some of these pieces of information along with Marty uh, together. Um, but I'll just begin with, um, I, I, always, <laughs> I always get nervous at the beginning of school. Um, I think I've told you this before, but the night before school starts, I inevitably can't sleep much past four o'clock in the morning. And although this year was different and a different opening and a different way of doing some of the work that we're doing, the same thing happened at four o'clock, my eyes were open and I was ready to go and, and up and up and at them. And I'm sure that many of our teachers and our students felt the same way. Um, simply because it, as different as it is, it still marks the beginning of something, of something new, something exciting, and in many ways, something to look forward to. So, so this year, um, as, as many of you know, that was part of our, conv our convocation earlier, um, in the, the week of teachers returning, um, we have selected this year that the time is always right to do what is right from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as our slogan that we're sort of working from uh, as we move forward. And we believe that that really allows us, I think, um, to dig in around our goals, around our work around equity, our work around racial justice, um, and, and our work just generally around the three, the three big pieces of um, our goals that we're working on. So um, anyway, I wanted just to start with that and let you know that I also on the first day had a chance to go into Schoology and I had my seven classes right there in my uh, courses for the day uh, and went through and had an opportunity to sit in um, with a number of, of different classes. And I started with the um, Miss Skelly's class in, um, in the starfish at JTP. And that was really a lot of fun to start my day at the preschool. If you ever need a smile, um, it, you always go to the preschool first because they will just make you smile and laugh every single time. Uh, and from there, I had a chance to see Ms. Stillwagoner's class over at Mount Daniel, her second grade class. Uh, and they were uh, doing a lot of really great stuff. Uh, got a chance to go see Josh Singer over at the high school. Uh, and he was teaching his TOK course. And that was really a lot of fun. Uh, and then I had a chance to go see Sarah Mim over at Thomas Jefferson. Uh, anyway, got into a multiple classes on that first day of school, and it was really heartening to see the kids' faces and to keep, to just to see them smiling and sort of reconnecting with each other. So um, what we've put in the presentation this evening are a couple of things. Um, first is we want to welcome our new school leaders. Um, some of these faces are familiar to you but may have changed position. And some of them are new completely. And we want to welcome uh, Mr. Marvin Wooten. Marvin is our new athletic director at George Mason High School. He came to us from Minnesota earlier this, uh, this summer. And Marvin brings a wealth of experience in athletic administration. And we're really excited to have him on board. He's met with the Booster Club and others already. And is making um, really great inroads on those relationships with those that we serve. Um, also, Hillary Trebles um, has made a change. She left um, Mary Ellen Henderson for the great beyond over at George Mason High School. And Hillary has taken a science position at George Mason, but also is serving as the assistant director of student activities there. And it is something that she's been uh, very interested in for a long time, as well as becoming an administrator. And this really, I think, gives her a great opportunity to uh, begin to learn um, more about the administrative ranks as she moves ahead. We also want to welcome Sarah Snyder. Sarah is uh, coming to us from Arlington County Public Schools, where she was the director of school counseling for the entire county in Arlington, um, but she wanted to move back to the city of Falls Church. Many of you know she's a Falls Church City product, um, came from George Mason High School, went through Mary Ellen Henderson and our schools, um, and it's very excited to be back at, at George Mason as the director of, of counseling there. And then uh, Mr. Peter Laub. Uh, Peter has left the classroom uh, to become an assistant principal at George Mason, another uh, George Mason graduate um, coming home to uh, continue his really great career here in the city of Falls Church. And we're excited to welcome Peter 
uh, to his new position. We also have some new leaders at Mary Ellen Henderson uh, that I wanna introduce you and the community to that you may not know. Uh, first is Adam White. Adam White was in charge of the Lighthouse program, um, which is uh, our program for students uh, who um, have some special needs. And he moved into an assistant principal role over at Henderson this year. Uh, and we welcome Brittany Allen Shaw. Brittany Allen Shaw was, uh, was a special education teacher and she is an aspiring administrator uh, and has her uh, endorsement in administration. And so to help her along her way, uh, to get her started in those administrative ranks, we, we moved her into a position where she's gonna be the special education administrator and she's already doing a tremendous job for us at Henderson. Um, some of you might know Darius Koulibaly. Uh, Dale, uh, Darius came uh, to Henderson from uh, Thomas Jefferson. You would know him when you see him because he's seven feet tall. Um, and it's, it's hard to miss, uh, but Darius uh, is moving over to be the new Lighthouse leader uh, at Henderson, and we're excited to uh, give him that opportunity because Darius also is an aspiring administrator, uh, and this is another sort of leadership opportunity for him as he leaves the classroom to go into to take on a leadership role. And then Dr. Rory Dippel, um, a face that everybody knows, but in a different position. Um, Dr. Dippold has uh, decided to move from his assistant principal position into the IBMYP coordinator position at Henderson, which is a complete gift um, to the City of Falls Church uh, because uh, Rory will help us through with our uh, reauthorization visits uh, and the like as he takes on uh, the challenges of the IBMYP curriculum uh, at both the middle school and will be transitioning between the middle and the high school with MYP. And we're really excited about Rory taking that on. We have some new teachers we wanna welcome. I won't go and uh, go through and name them all, um, but some of you have probably gotten a chance to meet some of them uh, along the way, but um, really uh, wanna thank our, our team again, uh, led by William Bates uh, for doing such a great new teacher orientation. But here is a, a picture of some of our new hires and we're excited to welcome them. Um, and then the first day of school, here's our, here's our guy himself, uh, Mr. Bates um, delivering um, welcome back swag bags to our new teachers that you just saw on the very first day of school. Here he is standing in front of a picture of Mary Ellen Henderson himself, herself um, with his mask on and his gloves on um, and, and taking, off, taking off to get those bags to folks. And we, we um, want to thank him for doing that. Um, JTP, um, here are some pictures. One of the things you'll see in these pictures is that many, many of our teachers are teaching their classes from their classrooms at the school site. Uh, in fact, about half of the teachers at Jesse Thackeray are teaching from their uh, classrooms and uh, they're really enjoying it because they have a chance to be around their materials and their supplies. The technology is reliable um, and they get an opportunity to be where uh, they're used to teaching. And so it's really been a lot of fun. But um, being in there in the JTP classroom that first day was pretty exciting. Um, I got sang, uh, there was a song that was sung to me, welcoming me to the class that morning. Um, and again, if you ever need a smile, that's where you go. But just a little bit of information about JTP. I asked each of the principals to share with me um, a celebration and a challenge that they're experiencing. Um, and one of the great uh, celebrations that uh, Director Baruti shared with me, who's done an extraordinary job at Jesse Thackeray is that there was greater excitement um, and engagement than she expected. And they got to see some students that they weren't expecting. Um, so it was really nice to see some students show up that were unexpected, um, but also to see the enthusiasm and engagement of the students that were serving. Um, one of the challenges that uh, we face at JTP is despite the support on our end, we weren't able to get all of the kids connected that first day. So this is at the end of day one. Um, we are working through some of those technological challenges um, as, as we speak. As a matter of fact, Dang and his team and then um, all, of, uh, all of the technology folks on site are working through those as well. Um, but you will see a theme. Um, you will see a theme here. And here we are at Mount Daniel. Um, at Mount Daniel, almost 100% of the teachers are teaching from their classroom. Um, you will see the teachers uh, and their paraprofessionals in their classrooms all set up. Uh, in different ways. You'll see um, the leader of the school there, um, Mr. Kasich in the top left-hand uh, row. Um, but I do wanna call attention to Gail Bodner. Um, Ms. Bodner's on the far right um, in front of her. She has dual screens set up in her classroom um, and has a number of cameras. It's uh, really sort of a studio-like experience that she set up for herself there. 
Um, but Ms. Bodner, who you'll see in just a second, was featured on NBC yesterday uh, at the five o'clock hour or six o'clock hour for her, um, her work, and we're really proud of her. At Mount Daniel, just in terms of attendance, this was the other piece of information I asked for. Um, we had a 96.7% attendance rate total at Mount Daniel. Um, you will see in here 126 of 137 of the students that are in kindergarten showed, 177 of 178 first graders were there, and 165 of 169 second graders were there. And those are kids that are registered. Um, so I want to make sure uh, that I'm sort of clear about this. The numbers that you'll see, the larger, um, the numerator, if you will, is the are the uh, students that we're expecting. Um, and then um, the students that showed up are the other students. The celebration uh, for them was that Schoology was up and teachers were able to see their students. And so when I was in Ms. Stillwagoner's class, I got a chance to see all the students and they were smiling and having a great time. And they got, so, uh, got the majority of their students uh, into their classes that first day. A challenge um, was getting kids into specials. Um, so you may have heard through the grapevine um, and, or through the community um, that some of our kids on that very first day had a hard time getting into their specials if they were using their parents' login. Um, Mr. D over at Mount Daniel is on top of that. And I think that should be resolved by the end of today. Uh, so there won't be any more issues. Uh, the problem was there was a login in Schoology that wasn't transitioned uh, appropriately, but we're, we're working through that. Um, moving ahead at Thomas Jefferson, here you'll see um, there is uh, a number of folks that are on site there working through the technology. Um, not as many teachers at Thomas Jefferson are teaching in their classrooms as they are <coughs> um, elsewhere uh, for whatever reason, but um, we did have great participation yesterday. Here you'll see 97.6% uh, and the breakdown by grade level um, of the students that are there. Uh, the celebration was that an overwhelming majority of students were able to log in to the online learning program on day one. Um, and then their challenge was that there were a number of parents there that expressed frustration with some of their unfocused, unwilling children to do online learning and are asking for assistance with that. So um, we have been reaching out um, per personally, um, Paul, uh, um, uh, Paul Swanson, the principal, as well as Amanda Davis, the assistant principal and school counselors um, have been reaching out. And I know that uh, Mr. Bates has as well um, to some parents to see how they may be able to support them, uh, particularly with students that are unwilling uh, or are unfocused. And that is going to be a challenge for us going forward. Um, but on balance, we had a really strong day of, of focused, engaged learning at Thomas Jefferson. Here we are at Mary Ellen Henderson. Um, in the upper uh, row on the second to the left, you'll see our fine principal, uh, Valerie Hardy, sitting on the floor in the front office. I think that's her favorite spot, um, but she does tend to, to go there and she was working away. Um, Henderson has nearly 100% of their teachers also teaching from their classrooms. Um, and uh, also want to uh, celebrate Ross Mandel, uh, who is um, upper uh, row, second from the right, and also Miss G, um, who is middle row, far right. Uh, they both were in a in that video yesterday that was shot with Miss Bodner, um, and want to thank them. Uh, there was some camera rolling uh, in there. So just a little data around Mary Ellen Henderson. 98.5% of our students um, were there, so uh, 601 out of the 610 that are enrolled. Um, the celebration was the overwhelming number of students that got in. Uh, and into the right class. The sixth grade was full of energy, as you can imagine sixth graders are uh, on the first day of school and actually goes on until the middle of the second semester with sixth graders typically as someone who taught sixth graders for a long time. Uh, I can tell you that with some authority. Um, our parking lot at Hender Henderson was full. Um, they did a great job um, launching their uh, uh, PAC advisory. Um, and then um, their challenge was some Schoology platform issues. So when there was some transitioning from um, their, their uh, video to their screen, unfortunately there were some glitches in it where some of the teachers were getting knocked out. So we're working through some of those challenges with Schoology as well. And last but not least, um, here we are at George Mason, um, upper um, middle, you'll see uh, Kristen Michael who spent part of her day there. Um, so thank you, Kristen, for being there. Um, and then some other teachers uh, as well. Um, a few handful of teachers are teaching from their classrooms there. 
um, but not as many as at uh, Henderson or at um, Mount Daniel. 99% enrollment the first day, or not enrollment, 99% participation the first day. We had 858 out of 868 students online. Um, all but 10 uh, logged in, and that was a huge celebration for them. Really impressive dialogues were happening, as um, Ms. Snyder alluded to earlier, between the students and the staff. Um, Student-led organizations were able to send out their welcome back messages to um, folks so we can get those student organizations going as well. Um, and then the challenge here was also making sure that Schoology rosters get updated. So for example, um, there was a little glitch um, where there were some shared classes between middle and high school where the high school uh, didn't add in the middle school students. So we're working through that as well. Um, here is uh, Ms. Bodner uh, herself. Um, this was a really great uh, little video that was put together by uh, NBC4 yesterday. They came out, they called us midday and said, hey, you guys are underway. Would you let us come in and do a story? And uh, thanks to John Brett and, and his guidance, um, we were able to show them around. And uh, Gail was on there along with, as I said, Ross Mandel and Ms. G and then also um, Josh Singer. And today, um, Josh Singer was, uh, was on again um, because uh, ABC News came in and did a, a quick feature. And this clip will be in the morning announcements tomorrow. So rather than play it now, um, this is, I believe, the um, six o'clock showing of the, uh, of the uh, piece itself on ABC. Um, but Josh will be uh, featured um, tomorrow in the morning announcements. By the way, uh, it was Mr. Singer's class that I sat in on uh, at George Mason the first day for his TOK class. And um, he is using um, the big whiteboard. He has a podium in front of him that's on wheels so he can manipulate his uh, technology to move to the whiteboard. He's also using our new streaming technology. Um, and so he is trying out the AVER cameras for us. So when the time is right, if we are able to move into a hybrid, we should be able to do some streaming at home as well. Um, but Josh will be a, a really great, uh, Mr. Singer will be a really great helper in helping us think through uh, how that might work. Whoops, I did it anyway, John. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop that there. Let me go back to uh, the presentation. So let me show you um, some projections and uh, enrollment and some variances. Um, this is uh, good information for you to have at your fingertips. And um, I do think it's right now, it's a little bit um, unnerving to me as I look at these uh, numbers because we have lost um, compared to projection um, 143 students across the system. Uh, sometimes projections come in, sometimes projections don't, but this is clearly an anomaly. And we have been tracking the number of students that have been leaving for homeschool or private school options and the like. Um, so you'll see here at the far right column, um, sorry, not the total far right column, but the third from the right where it says variance with projection, you'll see where the losses are. Um, and not surprisingly, some of the largest losses are at kindergarten. Uh, so some parents are keeping their, their rising kindergartners um, either home or keeping them in their preschools where they perhaps can do a kindergarten program. Uh, and then we're seeing uh, a rather significant loss at that transition point to George Mason as well. Um, and so some students are um, opting to go different places. Um, one last place that we are uh, worried about some of the numbers is at Jesse Thackeray. Um, currently we're serving 51 students um, when we normally serve uh, 71 and we project to 71. Um, so 20 students currently are not being served at Jesse Thackeray. So we're, we're anticipating that a number of those parents decided to keep their students home um, rather than use our online services. So we are, we're hopeful to reconnect with those families um, as soon as we're able to come back in some way. Um, and uh, the other thing for the good of the, the board and for the community is that um, we are working with uh, the Virginia Department of Education who's gonna be working, who is working with the state legislature to see if there is some way um, that school systems across the Commonwealth can be held harmless in their average daily membership from the year prior so that um, they are not losing the, the funds associated with the students that would normally have been there. Um, I, I worry about it. Um, a, a bit, 
Um, but I but I want everyone to know what we, I, I believe what we've put together is a high quality product given the circumstances that we're in. Um, so uh, if people are leaving, um, my hope is not uh, is that it's not because of the product that we're putting out there, but instead because of personal um, personal decisions um, and and family decisions. And I and I understand what a challenging time this is for our family. So I wanted to um, we wanted to go back and show you what George Mason High School looked on the opening day last year, um, because oh by the way, we also are building a new high school during this uh, pandemic process and opening online schools. Um, but this was George Mason last year. They had just completed um, digging the hole and we'll start, we're starting to put the structure uh, up. And here we are the first day of school this year. Um, and what a difference a year makes. Um, we are at a uh, close-in phase uh, for the most part at the high school. Um, they are continuing to do work on the inside with drywall uh, and uh, paint has gone in in a number of the rooms already, at least the first coat. Um, the almost all of the windows are in as well. So, and almost all of the, the um, brick work is done. So things are really coming along and we still are on time uh, and on target for that December um, completion. So moving ahead, um, just as a reminder to the board and to the community, I believe, Dr. Noonan, you, it appears you're frozen, at least on my screen. Dr. Noonan, you were frozen in your back. I just heard you ask if we okay. can hear you. I can hear you, yes. All right. I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut my video off for a minute. Um, Perhaps that will help with some of the bandwidth issues we might be experiencing. But you're moving, Mr. Anderson, so I assume you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we continue to pay attention to the big three um, of IB, Caring Culture, and Closing Gaps. Um, we want to be the premier international baccalaureate school division, not only in the country, but in the world. Um, and when you look at the work that we do across the division to incorporate um, the approaches to learning, approaches to teaching, and the learner profile. Uh, I don't think that there's anybody uh, better than we are with respect to IB uh, and it permeates everything we do. And so we wanna continue with that. Uh, we wanna to continue to work on this caring culture. And I talked about it at our convocation and the importance of ecosystemic resilience and how we as an organization are resilient, not as individuals. And one of the ways that we as an organization are resilient is through, um, is through high quality care for each other. Um, not just in our schools, but with our families and with our community as well. And then lastly, um, closing gaps. And this is where we get to looking at um, tailoring instruction by name and by need um, in, in the moment when kid, kids need it the most. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to think about it through a lens of equity and making sure that we're providing students what they need when they need it. Um, because for us to really provide that equitable uh, approach to students. It's not a one-size-fits-all model. Um, and so we are working very hard with our division leadership team to make sure that we look at our instructional programming, our curriculum, and everything else through the lens of equity. And of course, surrounding all of this is operational efficiency, best practices for teaching and learning and the like. And then lastly, um, I would just end where I began. And that is that um, the time is always right to do what is right. Um, and so it leads me, um, it leads us down a path to think about what does the rest of the year look like? Um, and we will continue to make decisions and judgments based on um, the best information we have um, so that we can continue to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons and, uh, and truly live out the time being always right to do what is right. So with that, uh, Chair Anderson, I will stop. That's our, our back to school report. Um, Happy to take any questions that you might have or the board might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Noonan. Um, and um, I will just take chair's privilege to congratulate you and the entire team at SCCPS on a stellar start to a year. And I think I saw a quote from somebody that everybody's a first year teacher this year. Um, and it all came off 
very well by all accounts at this point. So uh, I want congratulations, and I want to open it up for questions from the members. So uh, thank, thank you for that, Ms. Uh, Jerry Anderson. Um, it, it's really nice to hear. And I know that it wasn't perfect for every single family and every single kid, but by and large, it went really well. And I have to say, um, there were no late buses. There were no um, long lunch lines this year. <laughs> anyway, very different experience for sure. Yeah, no doubt. All right, um, questions from anyone or comments? Uh, Ms. Downs, I see you've gone off mute. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. And I think, you know, most of us on the school board have kids that we've been living it, you know, uh, real time and just want to thank you and your team and the teachers. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask in terms of the teachers, if you're seeing, um, how are they doing? Do they, I, I think I mentioned to you briefly before the call started, I know um, my two younger ones, their teachers both have their own kids at home, uh, you know, and so I know that it's, it's a heavy lift, especially with people, teachers own family obligations. So I just didn't know if you're seeing any themes or if there's any support that teachers need, anything that, I don't know, we can do. Just keep that in mind, because I know it's probably a little bit stressful right now for them. Yeah, I appreciate the, that. And I know that our teachers do too. Um, I think we're, pay, we're trying to pay very close attention to our teachers to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, I will say that the teachers that have come into the building um, and are working in their classrooms are very excited to one, see each other and have sort of a connection, albeit far away from each other, appropriately social distanced and with a mask. Um, and two, the excitement and the enthusiasm for seeing the kids. Um, you know, we, we as educators live, live for these days. This is what we've dedicated our lives to. So when we have a chance to be with kids and other educators, it, it's sort of, that's where we get our juice. And so I know a lot of people are really excited about it. I will say um, one thing that wasn't in the presentation, but I do wanna um, give credit where credit is due. And, and that goes to Kristen Michael and also to um, Katie Clinton. Um, yesterday, we did open our daycare for our staff uh, and, and to Rebecca Sharp as well. Um, and by opening our daycare for staff, although there are some concerns about staff having kids, um, we, we saw about almost 20 kids yesterday of teachers that took us up on our daycare um, program. And that really freed our teachers up to be able to work um, with, with our families and our students here in the City of Falls Church. And it, it really is a benefit that um, I think is the right thing to do. Um, and, and I think that our teachers really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Other comments or questions? Dr. Dimmick? I, from, from, from my household, it was a great start to the school year and I heard positive things from neighbors. It seemed to, at least in, in my little part of Falls Church, go off without a hitch and it was great. And the kids seemed excited to be back to school, though. I did hear from parents on the challenges of waking their kids up to actually go to school after that nice summer break. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Um, if, if the world does not go the way we want and we end up being in online school for a longer period of time, um, and I don't know if it's possible, but I did have a comment from one neighbor who has a, a one child in the elementary school and one child in the middle school, the lunch hours are off. And so it's, you know, she's working from home. It's easy for her to say to the office, this at lunch hour, I can't be on any phone calls. But when the lunch hour is then a lunch two hour period, um, it just does make it more challenging for the parents who are trying to supervise school from home. Um, I don't know what's possible on that, but if, if things look like, if it looks like we're gonna be in this for a long time, maybe that could be looked at. Um, and then the That's other- great feedback, I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, thanks. The other question I had um, is about class sizes. Um, what, and you know, I'm much less familiar with this at the middle school and the high school. Do we have optimal class sizes for the middle school and the high school? Um, I just, one of the classes that my son is in that a number of his friends are in is a really large class. Um, and I sort of was wondering, gosh, even if they had that was in the building, would they all fit in the same room? 
Um, and so I was wondering if we had, like, are there, I know we have class sizes for younger grades. Sure. We do staff, um, we, we do staff at a number at the middle and high school. And, and I'll just share with you that this is a, uh, and you, you, and I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but this is a traditional issue right at the beginning of the year is balancing some classes. Um, we, for example, we have an uh, honors geometry class that is super huge. Um, and we are working to resolve that this week um, so that we can uh, relieve the pressure that one of our Jen Jason is under um, at, in her class. So uh, we are taking them one at a time and bringing those numbers down as best we can. We staff the classes at 24 to one um, at the secondary level. Um, our neighbors next door, for example, staff at 29 to one. Um, so it is an advantage that we have um, comparatively to, to others in the surrounding jurisdictions because we do have more teachers um, per capita than other, other schools. Because we staff at 24 to one doesn't necessarily mean that we have 24 kids and no more in classes. Um, but we, what we do look at is on balance, do teachers typically have 24 or less as an, as an average. So you may have a class of 17 kids, but you might also have a class with 26, but we try to keep them as low as possible and under 24 whenever possible. Are there things that you can do this late in the year? I, my impression is that this teacher has one class of 36 and one class of 31, which seems like maybe a heavier load for the teacher as well as a, just a large class to manage online. Yeah, it's too, that's too big. And, and there are things that we can do. Um, typically, there are not single sections of things. Um, where we get into um, issues is when, when it's a singleton, right? It's a one-time offering and there are 33 kids. That class shouldn't have, that shouldn't have happened. It should have been capped. But in the case where you might have 31 in a seventh grade English course, um, there are more, there are other seventh grade English courses that are taught throughout the day. So there is some balancing again that, that's going to go on. So we're trying to work through each of those independently, but it's not too late. Um, and I know William Bates, uh, Mr. Bates, our CAO, has been working closely, uh, for example, with uh, Mr. Hills and with Ms. Hardy to try to resolve some of the secondary issues even as late as um, about six o'clock this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Ms. Downs. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. I want to piggyback on um, Dr. Demick's um, comment about the lunches. I was actually going to bring that up as well. Um, so for, for TJ and for Mount Daniel, um, they have a one o'clock lunch and they start at nine. So that's a four hour period. And it's tough for the little, little guys and little girls for four hours. I mean, they're not, you know, there's Wiggle, wiggle breaks or whatever they call it, little different breaks, and they're going in and out to, um, you know, different things. But generally, they're on the on the um, screen from nine to one, and that's also a later time for lunch than they're used to. Um, usually, generally, they have lunch when they would be in person earlier than that. Um, so, just <laughs> from my own the Downs household, I'm feeding them at noon because they're starving. Um, and then, you know, after lunch, then it's only two hours and then it's, you know, so it seems a little bit, you know, four hours and then two hours after lunch. I mean, if, if there was a way to have all everyone eat lunch, I would, I would, um, propose moving the Mount Daniel TJ lunch to 12. Um, so that is three hours, lunch, three hours. Um, so that's just my two cents. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask Dr. Noon is just some clarification. So I'm understanding the, the enrollment numbers. I know you had given us the number of 52 or so. Um, and so I was wondering if you could, um, ex sorry, <laughs> if you could explain, um, and I understand that the chart you showed tonight was variance off projections, but could you just go through that one more time for me so I'm understanding the 50 number you gave us versus the 143 number? Um, are you talking about the 51 number at Jesse Thackeray that I talked about? I don't know. About? You gave us, I think, in your Noonan's notes, a number that was like, there was, a, I thought it was like 50, stu maybe students had pulled out to homeschool, maybe? Um, yeah, we, we, have, we have a certain number of kids that have pulled out for homeschool, and then there are others that we just don't know uh, at okay. the point where they are. So okay. we're trying to reconcile that information now. So the number that was projected that also, by the way, the projection doesn't mean that they were here and now they're not coming. That projection is looking at a number of different factors that right. um, 
come that that comes from the University of Virginia, the Weldon Cooper Center. Right. Um, and they are not guessing, but they're they're telling us how many they expect us to have. Right. And that was but what we have budget was based on. Right. Yes. And that's what the right. budget is based on. That's right. 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 So okay. um, so we may if we were to add back all the students that homeschool, for example, we still might be off projection a little bit. Um, but those kids that we would be off from the projection were kids that just never materialized, if you will. Okay. I was just, yeah, I, I had it in my mind that it was 52 kids or something based on that number in Noonan's notes. So I was just was surprised when I saw that 143. So that, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. It so it's 55 homeschool kids this year versus 24 that we had homeschool last year. Gotcha. So what you're, what we're seeing is a spike in the homeschooling. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, Ms. Russell. Thank you, Chair Anderson. <clears throat> and thank you, Dr. Noonan, for that really thorough report. And it was great to see all those pictures and um, I guess hear the, the highlights and I guess the challenges. Um, I thought it was a fantastic update. And thank you, Mr. Bates, for all the fantastic work that you have done um, getting our teachers ready into this point. I know it's been a huge effort for everyone on the team and um, you know, just working, I guess, pretty much all of you and staff working throughout this summer to make this happen um, is just a huge undertaking and much appreciated by, I guess, our community and our families and especially this board. Um, I guess I had one comment and then just one small question. Um, so I guess the small question was if you had any sense, I noticed that the attendance seemed to be I guess for lack of a word, significantly lower for the third grade than any of the other grades. And I don't know if there was any thought behind that, but it just seemed all the other ones were kind of more around the high 90s and third grade just seemed to dip lower than that. If, if I had to guess, and it would be purely conjecture, it's that that's the transition year from Mount Daniel to, um, to uh, Thomas Jefferson, and that there may have been some issues with Schoology and getting the files mm -hmm. transferred over. That would be my my best guess. But we could we could do a, a deeper dive and, and figure that out. But I'm I'm more interested to find out also like how many kids are there now. <laughs> yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And I guess the second one was just a comment. Um, and I've said this before at our school board meetings that I initially, you know, I'm originally from Washington State and I have a lot of ties back there, um, including several friends who are teachers. And um, one of my good friends teaches at a, in the Shoreline District, which is north of Seattle, and it's about 9,000 students. And she was actually posting on social media this week regarding um, a plea for families not to take their children out of the schools and how it affected that. So I guess what I wanted to say as well, it's certainly not pleasant. Um, I wanted to reassure you that it's, we are not an outlier um, and this seems to be a national trend. So um, it doesn't make it any easier to digest, but it, it, it's certainly not us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Uh, are there other questions? I'd like to address something if that's okay, that wasn't in the update perhaps. Of course, Dr. Newton, go ahead. And, uh, yeah, because I, I think one of the questions that is, is continuing to swirl out there is, uh, when are we going to bring kids back? Um, and, and we know that some of our surrounding jurisdictions have put out some information regarding bringing back special education students and ESOL students. Um, and and I, um, I want the, the board to know that um, at our next regular meeting, we do plan to bring a draft set of metrics and measures uh, for reopening for you all to look at um, that we can kind of talk through um, that are, are deeply rooted in um, three categories. One is the actual data of health um, that we, and we're looking at the Virginia Department of Health and their dashboard or their composite that they put together, which is an eight factored composite. Um, along with a couple of other um, local factors that we're looking at. Um, the second part of that is operations. Can we operationally open? In other words, can we get our buildings clean? Do we have the right amount of PPE, et cetera? And then the last factor that we're paying attention to in terms of measures is instruction. Do we have the, uh, the right number of teachers to open and the like? Um, we've, we've said all along that we want data to um, data and safety to drive decision-making for us. And 
um, we want we really want to stand by that um, a lot. And I, I certainly don't want to um, say anything that in any way would um, be disparaging of my, my colleagues from surrounding jurisdictions, but I will tell you that their plans were put out prior to any development of metrics or measures. Uh, and without knowing what the Virginia Department of Health is currently reporting. And I, I'll share with the board tonight in the community, and that is that what the Virginia Department of Health is reporting right now is not positive. Um, it, it is showing that um, last week we went from a low risk in the Northern Virginia region to a moderate risk. So the risk of COVID transmission actually is going up in our area. Um, and part of that is due to you know, summer, people sort of um, not giving up, but becoming more lax in uh, wearing masks, maybe a little bit more social gatherings, um, et cetera. But bottom line is right now, the data is not going in a good direction. So as we think about our division as a whole and bringing back 2,700 kids, we need to really be thoughtful about what those metrics are and measures within those three categories. There, there are some areas where if we look at um, small, small numbers, for example, a small number of our high need special education students or a small number of our um, ESOL students where we may have some opportunities, um, but not right away. And I, I just wanna say up front, one of the things that we wanna do is be really careful, really thoughtful, um, and we wanna try to continue to work with um, try to work with our local health department to partner around some of this work so that we can um, utilize strategies that give people a sense of, of safety beyond just um, PPE. So for example, we've been working with the health department to see if we might be able to do some rapid testing with our kids and with our families. Um, and we are running up against some challenges um, and the challenges, um, a lot of it are respective to the actual test, the rapid test itself. Um, but what we do know is if you do multiple rapid tests, that the validity of those tests go up. So how might we be able to test more? Um, so, so this is a long way of saying that um, we do, and I want to assure you, and I want to assure the community that we are working internally right now. We're not ready to um, put out anything publicly, but we are working internally to try to develop pathways for us to start bringing back some of our some of our most vulnerable populations in a way that is, that is thoughtful, a way that's meaningful and one that is safe. Um, and, and our hope is that in the next several weeks, we'll be able to share with you um, what that might look like, but we are looking for community partners. Um, I've reached out to a number of local physicians for some help. Um, I've reached out to uh, a couple of local universities for help. Um, but we are we are interested in trying to figure out how we can bring back some of our most vulnerable populations of kids, particularly our youngest learners. So I just wanted you to know that um, and say that publicly out loud tonight um, for all of you, in case you had questions. Thank you, Dr. Newton. Um, I know that certainly we've there have been some some members in the community that do have questions that have come to us about um, what can be done to bring our most high needs children, our most vulnerable populations of kids back, even if it's only small numbers, even if it's uh, under extremely special circumstances. And so having that information is, is helpful because I know we're, we're getting active questions about that. So, um, Mr. Webb, you got your hand up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, I want to say thank you for, for bringing the topic up tonight. It is a topic that uh, not only myself, but I'm sure other members of the board are hearing from um, community members with students with, with special needs uh, and English language learners. And I think by them hearing some of the communities and large jurisdictions around us are starting to, to say or put out dates of when they plan to bring students back, I think only heightens it for our community looking at ways to bring students back into our building. So um, I do appreciate you um, discussing this, talking about uh, maybe having a deeper conversation about this at our next meeting, because I think um, it puts us in a better place to to lay out measures that we and, and kind of guides of where, of what we're looking at 
to make that very important decision. So I do appreciate that and look forward to um, our discussion about it. And I'm quite sure that parents will be paying attention and listening as well to that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, are there other comments or questions? Um, not seeing any active right now. I'll go ahead and just ask a couple of uh, a couple of my own. So, um, Dr. Noonan, on the the reduction in enrollments relative to projection and what we actually know is is happened with the significant increase in the homeschooling, um, the hold harmless on um, our funding form under our uh, ADMs. The, my question is two things. One is, do we have an estimate at the current level of sort of what the change might be um, for, for upcoming years, um, FY22 and so on? The other one is, um, is this something that, um, and I, now I look, this is, I'll stop there because the next question is actually more towards the, towards the members. So I'm, I'm actually gonna turn to Ms. Michael because she, she has off the top of her head, more information about the sales tax information and then ultimately the ADM hold harmless. We may not exactly have those data, but um, Chris, uh, Ms. Michael, can you share what you know about that? Yes, thank you. I'm going to go over the sales tax projection update as part of the monthly budget report, but the state has revised their forecast. And just for next year, um, this current year, excuse me, we're looking at a projected decrease in sales tax of just under $350,000. And they're also projecting that same level of decrease the following year. Um, so in, in that case, the sales tax loss is significant. When we think of state aid, um, one of the things is we're really hampered in the state in terms of revenue because we have an LCI of 0.8, um, but, but state aid is very important to us. And we get about $2,000 per student. Now that's based on our ADM and we have to look at what the state projected for ADM um, as compared to, to what our projection was for next year. Um, but it's really about $2,000 per student. So again, when you combine that loss in state aid, um, even if you think of 150 students times 2,000, you can see the loss between state aid and sales tax is really significant when you, when you think of our funding overall. Thank you very much, Ms. Michael. That's, um, and, and we'll hear more about it in the upcoming item. Um, my question to the members is, um, this looks like to me perhaps an opportunity that we might want to think about how our legislative liaison could be in communication with folks um, as appropriate. I don't know uh, what others think about that idea, but just something I put out there for us to think about. Having the appropriate conversations with our, uh, with our local legislators would be a, a helpful thing, I suspect. Okay, <laughs> I'll take that to be nobody's uh, objecting strenuously. Um, so then my other question, Dr. Noonan, on this one is, um, you're talking about some of the, uh, some of the, the struggles with uh, some of the, uh, what was the comment, um, a little bit of difficulty with some of the kids at TJ that are, that are having a little bit of more difficulty focusing, more difficulty engaging. How are we gonna be able to, to reach out and help those, uh, those students and those families? I know that you, you said this is happening right now, so I'm just sort of curious what that kind of looks like. Yeah, I, I think, thank you for the question. Um, it started with the uh, administrative team reaching out and the school counselors reaching out. Um, it was a handful, it wasn't a lot. Um, so I think they're gonna try to take those on a case by case basis. But um, the other thing that we have tried to do is to put materials and, and the like together for families around how to make a routine. Um, how, do you, how do you manage in circumstances where you are um, having to help a student who's in an online learning program. And we've put those materials out, not only in Parent University, but they came out in a couple of the road to reopening documents as well. Um, but if there are some, some real significant issues, um, you know, if we need to, we'll get other uh, professionals in the system involved, whether it's social workers or, uh, or the like. Okay, thank you. Um, other comments or questions? I have one more I wanna ask, but I wanna open it back up. Mr. Reitinger. <clears throat> Just a, 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 not a question for now, but a question 
uh, for Dr. Noonan and for us in the future. You know, it seems to me that gathering data on you know the 150 odd kids who are we expected to be here and are not here, and sort of the the why and what's coming in the future would be very important. Um, in the sense that projections for next year are going to be even more difficult. You know, with the pandemic, entire patterns of where people live and how people work have changed, and it's going to be very difficult to predict. You know, are is some of the shift to homeschooling permanent due to the increased risk of communicable diseases? You know, are are people with kids less likely? Um, to live in a city like Falls Church because now work from home and remote working is possible. So um, I think trying to, to gather some of those things and it's not really something, it will probably rely on um, a lot of folks who have more money to invest than we do, possibly including the city as well. But I, I, there are gonna be a lot of big questions for us to consider going into the budget season next year and doing projections for how many students. And so I would just suggest that we need to make sure that we are collecting data in a fairly um, uh, intense way now to the extent we can do it so that we can make those projections when it comes up. Thank you. I, I appreciate that comment, Mr. Reitinger. I, I will say we've cross-referenced at this point the homeschoolers that we've had in the past um, with the homeschoolers we have now and anytime um, someone homeschools, they have to submit a, a packet and, and a letter and the like. And I would say um, about 50% of the parents who are homeschooling have said that they intend to return once we're back face to face. And so we have been tracking those as well. Um, but the 50% who haven't indicated that, it would be a good conversation to have. I know um, many of our principals are reaching out to each of the families to ask some questions. Um, but but thank you for for sharing that because I think you are right. I think it is going to be hard to uh, unless unless something drastically changes in the next six months, um, which we I think we're all hopeful for, in terms of some sort of therapeutic or um, some sort of vaccine. Um, it's going to be it's going to be difficult to to maneuver through. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Uh Go ahead. Just a just one quick note. Um, I mean, I think. I agree with you completely. I just say that even with a therapeutic a vaccine, some things are not going to go back. Um, and so we need to keep that into account. No, I think that's right. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Um, other comments or questions? And of course, Ms. Snyder, if you've got any, you're welcome to, um, but anybody else who's, who's got a thought? Dr. Noonan, a question that's associated in some ways with um, both support for the, the families of students who are the most vulnerable, and also I, in some ways I extend this to support thinking about um, just parents who are, who are trying to work through the process of supporting their children. Um, there's a lot of creative ideas that are floating that are being proposed in various forms. And, and have we given thought to some kind of a structure that would allow us to have those ideas come in and, and help inform our thinking in a little bit more structured way? How can we best channel those sorts of creative energies? Um, I, you know, I would invite anyone, first of all, to send me their, their thinking. Um, I think we're trying as, as hard as we can to reach out and, and make ourselves open to that. Um, you know, un unfortunately, there was one um, big creative idea that came up around the potting, um, and it was just not something that we as a school system could support directly. Um, but if but if people do have um, ideas that they wish to share, I don't know that we necessarily have a, a formal way to do it, but I would invite them to send it to reopeningfdcps.org, um, and I, I think that that would be a great way to, to share information with us. And that does get checked routinely by uh, Rory Dippold still. Thank you, because the, on, on that particular address, um, we have a few comments that have come to me. I've directed people to make a suggestion through that. And uh, the feedback I had from a couple of them was that they hadn't sent it there originally because um, they didn't view it as a question they were looking for an answer. It was an idea they wanted to share. So knowing oh. that it would be useful as a way of getting ideas is also, I think, helpful. So That's great. You'd be surprised how many I get that are not questions at all and are just statements or ideas. <laughs> I think it would be great. <laughs> All right. 
All right. Well, then, um, thank you. I wanted to make sure to, to ask that question. Yeah, Are there yeah, um, any other final thoughts? Any other final questions? Ah, Ms. Downs. Yes. Uh, just a quick thanks to, I think, echoing Ms. Russell's comments, a quick thanks to Mr. Bates. Um, you know, again, I, I always bring up the boys, but having four boys and it was seamless. I mean, it just kudos to you and the teachers and all the staff supporting everyone. It's just amazing um, the heavy lift you all did this summer. So thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Bates and his instructional team were, were quite amazing this year to get everybody trained up and, and ready to roll. So appropriately placed kudos. Uh, I think that's a good note on which to say thank you, uh, Dr. Noonan, for the presentation. Thank you to Mr. Bates, you and the entire instructional team, but also all of Team FCCPS for the for bringing together uh, uh, what looks to have been a really good launch for 2020-2021 uh, for 2020, under extraordinary circumstances. So thank you. Um, and we'll go ahead and move on to uh, the next topic on the agenda for tonight, um, which is our uh, monthly budget monitoring report. Um, and Dr. Noonan? Uh, I think we'll go ahead and uh, I, I took that as a gesture to go to Ms. Michael. Sorry, you think by now I'd have it figured out. I'll, I'll turn it right over to Ms. Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much this evening for the opportunity to present our monthly monitoring report. This is for June, so it's our fiscal year end for 2020. So the report tonight will be a little bit longer because I'm going to go over not only just the operating fund, but also the food service and the community services fund. So the data that we're sharing tonight for the operating fund is as of August 20th, and for the food service and the community services fund, the data was as of August 7th. Um, and just a reminder to the board, all of this data is subject to the final audit. So these numbers could shift slightly um, before the general government finishes the final audit. This year, we're actually presenting this information to you a month earlier than our prior years. We have previously been doing it in September. And we also continue to work to enhance the data that, that we're providing tonight. Um, but my ability to present this report tonight is really due to the tremendous work of Michelle Kopic, our budget and finance director, all of our school finance secretaries, the principals, directors, and our central office staff who really worked tirelessly this summer to complete the receiving, to process all the payments, and to ensure that we could get all of our purchase orders closed. Um, this is truly a team FCCPS effort, and for that I'm really grateful. So I'm going to start with the school operating fund. I'm showing the chart on page one on the screen. So overall our revenue in our school operating fund this year totaled 51.8 million and our expenditures totaled 50.3 million. So as a result of those combined, our school operating fund um, ended the year um, with our beginning balance increasing 1.6 million prior to our encumbrances. And encumbrances are orders that were placed, but either the goods had not yet been delivered or the bills hadn't been paid. So we need to take those into account. And once we do that, the available funding at the end of the year was 1.4 million. And I'd like to first talk through how did we get there and then some recommendations for what we do with that funding. So I'm gonna start at the revenue portion of the chart. When we look at our revenue of 51.8 million, that was $496,301 less than we had budgeted. So when we look at that by category, our other revenue was below budget by $236,000. That category included our school bus stop arm camera violation revenue. And that revenue for the year actually ended at 147,000 higher than we had budgeted. And that's because we were trending significantly above budget prior to COVID. And if you'll remember last summer, we had added those stop arm cameras on all of our buses. So that helped generate revenue that exceeded our budget prior to the COVID shutdown. But that other revenue was offset by losses in other categories, um, most significantly being tuition and fees. So we didn't charge tuition revenue for JTP for our community peers for the fourth quarter. And then we also reduced fees that we charged like student parking. And then we had reduced rental fees um, that are associated for groups that use some of our facilities. And you'll see a little of that in the operating fund and most of that in our community services fund. So on this chart, the use of our fund balance is shown as zero because our expenditure savings exceeded our revenue. So we have no beginning balance usage shown there. 
In terms of our state revenue, our final state revenue came in $234,069 higher than we budgeted. So one of our bright points, sales tax, even after the impact of COVID came in nearly $90,000 higher than budgeted. So while we saw a decrease from COVID, it was not nearly as steep as we had projected. So when you look at that loss, our greatest loss occurred in April when our sales tax revenue was 12.7% lower than what was budgeted. But that was really the only month with a serious decrease. Our sales tax in March was only 1.3 below the budget and May 2.4. And both of those were offset by our February sales, which were 7.5% higher. So just pre-COVID, and we saw a really big bump in our sales tax. So that's how overall it came in, just about 90,000 higher than budgeted. That was offset a little bit by our state aid, um, which ended up being $40,000 lower than budgeted. And state aid, as Dr. Noonan indicated earlier, is based on our March 31st ADM. Um, and our final ADM for this um, year that just ended FY20 was eight students lower than projected. But that was combined with some other state revenue adjustments to come up with that net decrease of $40,100. Also included in our state revenue was our state technology grant payments and in FY20 we received two. Um, those are both 154,000 and that was due to a late receipt of revenue from a request that we submitted at the end of 2019. So that's how overall our state aid came in 234,000 higher than we budgeted. The next line federal revenue shows that we were 43,000 below our budget. And that's primarily due to Title I funding that we had hoped to receive in FY20, um, but we should be receiving that in FY21. That reimbursement has already been submitted, but payment not yet received. Then our transfer from the general government, we had um, previously been projecting that it potentially could be reduced. Um, but prior to us finishing this financial report, we had heard nothing from the general government about our transfer being reduced and the full transfer had been posted. Um, so we're very hopeful that that transfer will continue to be there and we won't see any decrease this current year. So when you combine all of those revenue categories together, that's how we show that decrease of 496,000. And remember of that 450 is that unused um, beginning balance. So really a revenue loss of just about $50,000. When we look at the expenditure side of our operating fund, our expenditures totaled 50.3 million. And after we include that encumbrance for those orders that were placed but the goods not yet received, um, our expenditures were 1.9 million lower than we budgeted or 3.7% lower than budgeted. So when we think of our expenditures by category, our largest expenditure category is salaries followed by benefits. So our salaries came in 345,000 or just 1% lower than budgeted. Um, that's significantly less than that 3.1% variance we had in 18 and slightly lower than our variance of 1.1% in FY19. Then our benefits came in 270,000 um, under budget or 2.3% lower than, than what we budgeted. And again, that is slightly less than the 2.4% variance we had in FY19. So just as a reminder for anyone listening, in FY20, in addition to using the methodology that we started in FY19 for projecting salaries and benefits, um, in FY20, we had included budgeted savings from a uh, lapse from turnover. And then in FY21, this upcoming year, just um, as another point, we had increased our budget for turnover by an additional 290,000 for next year. So as compared to FY20. So when you look at then um, really kind of the larger portion of our savings, they're all from our logistics categories. All of these were impacted by the global pandemic. And when we um, closed school in March, we had said we had a higher increase and that we were only purchasing items that were absolutely essential, um, knowing that potentially we were facing revenue losses. So our expenditure freeze um, really did result in expenditure savings. So first, our contracted services were underspent by about $412,000 or 13.3%. That's primarily from savings and professional development or about 134,000. We had savings in our maintenance contracts of 46,000. And then we also underspent in tuition that we pay to other school divisions and private schools. That was 245,000. When we looked at our utilities, insurance and travel and rental, um, those were also underspent by 241,000. And really that is entirely due to abated rent for our central office. 
So when we leased our central office space, that first year's rent was abated, we didn't have to pay it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. When we look at materials and supplies, they too were underspent by $321,000 or 21.3%. That was savings that resulted in testing that didn't occur, textbooks, instructional material, and bus fuel. And all of those savings were offset by additional expenditures that we made for custodial supplies um, as we were working our way through the COVID pandemic and getting ready for this current year. Our capital and capital replacements were overspent by 425,000 or 69.1%. And that was due to the purchase of a replacement bus. Um, that bus you'll see in the encumbrances, we had placed our order for that a very long time ago, um, near the beginning of last school year. And it finally was delivered today. Um, and then we also had some additional technology purchase as we were getting ready for the COVID shutdown that were partially supported through the state technology grant and the use of our E-rate funding and then the lastly, our technology lease costs were slightly under budgeted. Um, in the reserves and transfers category, um, when we look at that, our expenditure budget um, is, is also impacted from that unspent contingency funding. So again, after we account for all of those variances and expenditures and the encumbrances, um, our expenditures were 1.9 million lower than we budgeted. Um, just as a reminder to people listening, um, with the impact of COVID last year, we did continue to pay our employees through the end of the fiscal year. Um, but again, we really froze our expenditure saving in those other categories. Um, and you'll see that particularly in the chart on page three of this report that compares the expenditure savings this year with our expenditure savings in the prior year. Um, I also, um, it's hard to, to move two screens. Um, when we look at our um, chart overall, um, what you'll see is in the second chart on this page, it shows what the actual revenue was and the actual expenditures, right? And that we have 1.4 um, million available after the end of this fiscal year. The top chart on this page talks about the recommendations that we brought to the school board pre-COVID. At that time, we had asked the board if we could have an authorization to spend funding that was in our capital improvement fund that resulted from the general government's um, revenue that came in over budget the prior fiscal year. And then we had also asked at that time if we could have authority to spend some funding from our year on balance. And of those things, we have completed some and we also deferred some, making sure that this fiscal year ended on solid footing. So I wanted to talk through our recommendations for year end at 1.4 million. Um, that we would like to present tonight and then come back to the board for potential action in September. So the first thing on our chart, when you look at the second chart, um, following that 1.4 million available, is we would like to recommend that we make a transfer to the food service fund. I'm gonna go over the food service funds budget in just a moment. Um, but when we look at the food service fund, they continue to provide meals for students and families in need all through the school shutdown. Um, but during that time, as we continue to pay our employees, that fund posted a loss of $249,000. So we would like to recommend that the school board transfer funding to the food service fund to cover that loss from the school year that just ended. But we also need to recognize that they're also going to have a loss this next year as well because they won't have paid revenue. So that's a recommendation to allocate 500,000 of this funding towards food service. The second recommendation is our infrastructure investments that are the chart on the top. Those are the things that we brought to the school board pre-COVID, um, but we didn't move forward with all of them um, because we really wanted to ensure we were on that solid footing. To that chart, we've added two additional things that we would really like to do um, while schools are learning virtually. And one of those projects is we would like to switch to LED lighting in all of our schools. Um, over the summer, we completed Mary Ellen Henderson in advance of our connection to the new high school this winter. Um, if you go in that school, the lights are bright, um, they're really great, and they're also saving us money in our utilities. And we would like um, to be able to spend 61,000 of our ending balance to allow us to convert all of our other schools interiors to LED lighting while students are learning virtually. Um, this is a great thing that we can have staff do um, that will make a lasting impact in terms of better lighting and reduced utility savings. Then the last thing on this chart is we had rent abatement savings of about 250,000 this year from our central office lease. 
Um, in the event that we need to end our lease early for some reason, that abated rent would need to be returned to the landlord. So we would just like to set that funding aside separately from our ending balance um, until we're sure that we wouldn't need that for any reason. So when you look at all of those recommendations, it changes the funding available to add to our ending balance to this $524,198. Um, and that is shown here on our fund balance chart at the very bottom of the screen. Um, so those were already taken account into this calculation. Um, so it shows that we would have added 524,000 and that brings our fund balance to $2,675,575. And that fund balance on this chart that you can see, it's higher than the years that we've included on this chart. It's really um, just a little bit higher than our fund balance was in 2014, um, but I elected to limit the number of years on each chart to make them fit on the page. And um, when we think of that fund balance looking ahead to next year, um, we do know that we will be facing revenue challenges as were indicated earlier. And um, we have that projected decrease in our sales tax funding as compared to our budget for this current um, FY21 of $350,000. And then we also really do need to plan for basic aid. Um, so in the event that the state did not put that whole harmless provision in place, um, if our state aid is adjusted based on our average daily membership and our enrollment is down, we are going to see potentially another loss of anywhere from $133,000 to $300,000. So when we look at those two together, right, unless we have a more significant expenditure savings and we've adjusted for um, salary lapse, and we would need to use that available ending balance to help us address those. Um, so that balance taking into account what we might spend, and um, we feel making these recommendations in terms of these investments at this point in time is a prudent activity. So next I wanna talk about the food service fund. Our food service fund, as a result of the combined revenue and expenditures, um, their ending balance decreased by $249,000. So revenue for food service um, totaled $669,000 for FY20, and that was $433,000 less than we had budgeted. Um, and it was also $131,000 or 16.5% lower than the revenue in the previous year. So when we look at the variance in terms of the actual and budget for food service, it's really due to food sales, right? And food sales are paid sales, also impact the funding we receive from the National School Lunch Program, because we do receive a small reimbursement for every paid lunch sold as well. So in this report, I included a chart um, that looks at our cafeteria sales at every single school and it compares the current year with the prior year. So when we closed our schools in March, um, that impacted all of our schools. Now, based on the number of days that we missed, you would assume that each school would see kind of a decrease in overall revenue of about 33%. Um, but this chart really reflects not only the impact of COVID, but the impact of other activities that were happening pre-COVID. So for example, um, breakfast sales at Henderson were down, and we think in part it was due to how we routed students into the building during the day due to the construction. Um, at George Mason, the number of lunch periods was reduced from four to three, um, which made lunch lines longer and students tell us that they don't like to wait in line. Um, and as a result, they might bring food. And that's one of the great things we're looking forward to in the new high school scramble service, which we hope will address those lines. Um, the rodeo Wednesdays at George Mason also impacted breakfast sales just based on the timing of when kids had their breaks. When we look at Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson as compared to the previous year, um, they had lost students in terms of enrollment, but also really looking at Revolution Foods who provided food at Mount Daniel um, had really impacted the sales um, when we didn't have the kitchen open at Mount Daniel due to the construction and those kids have moved on to TJ. So as we think about um, food service, Richard and his team are really working hard in terms of opportunities for next year we have joined the National School Lunch Program for our students at Henderson and Mason to help increase our federal revenue and make those students available for other benefits like EBT cards. And his team is also really working on proactive ways that we could even provide food to students who pay during this time. So he's actually already reached out to the PTA to get their input on ideas. When we think of expenditures in the food service fund, expenditures for the food service fund were 918,000 and that was 184,000 or 16.7 lower than what we had budgeted. And it was also 53,000 or 
6% higher than the previous year. When we look at that, our salaries were up $30,000 or 7.5% and benefits were up $20,000 or 15.3%. Our food services and supplies though were down 94,000 or 20.8%. Um, so when we look at food services, they were really significantly impacted by a variety of things this year. So when we look at food service and that loss of $249,000 and what it does to their ending balance, you can see here that prior to this fiscal year, their ending balance was $274,000. So their fund balance was able to cover this loss of $249,000, but it makes their um, reserve funding available only $25,000. So when we look at this current year, we know that they will not have enough revenue to cover their expenditures, particularly because we're closed now, unless we provide them with additional funding. Um, so the recommendation would be to transfer 500,000, which would really kind of cover this gap from the current year, right? Cover the gap at the beginning of this year. And then if we're back in school um, after the end of the first quarter, right? Hopefully we would be able to end FY21 with an available balance similar to the 274,000 that we started FY20. Lastly, when we look at our community services fund, our community services fund, when we look at the impact of revenue and expenditures, their fund balance at the end decreased by $176,499. So revenue for the community services fund totaled 1.6 million. That was 818,000 or 33.8% less than we budgeted. And that was primarily due to fees for services being lower than what we budgeted for. Um, so we included in this report, um, a chart that shows those fees both for our daycare program and for our community use. So when we look at our daycare fees, they were 19.7% um, below budgeted and community use fees are lower than last year. And our community use fees decreased by 10%. And that's how we get to that net decrease of 17.8% um, in terms of our overall fees. When we look at our expenditures for the Community Services Fund, our expenditures totaled 1.7 or 1.8 million. Of that, our salaries were 230,000 or 18.4% lower than budgeted, and our benefits were 10.8 lower than budgeted. When we look at our Community Services Fund, um, both the daycare program and community use are really dependent on revenue. And typically their staffing is based on the revenue that they receive. When we look at the impact of fund balance in this fund, um, their fund balance going into um, this fiscal year was 908 or after this fiscal year is 918,000. So this new chart on fund balance at the bottom of this fund shows in the top section, the combined fund balance for the whole fund. And then we've broken it out by what the fund balance is for our daycare program as separate from community use. Um, we know this is something that's really helpful to the daycare advisory board and we hope it's, it's helpful to the school board as well. So when you look at the ending balance in this fund, um, our daycare program um, has an ending balance or available funding of 502,000 and our community used fund balance is 416,000. So kind of nearly half and half for that fund balance. Um, so this fund was well able to weather um, the gap in revenue that occurred at the end of FY20. And they should also then be um, able to manage in this current fiscal year as well without additional support from the operating fund. So lastly, in this report, um, as always, we show a detailed chart that shows the budget and the actual revenue um, by each object um, and for every single fund. So thank you for the opportunity to present this very long report this evening. Um, and, and again, thank you so much to all of the staff at FCCPS um, that really make this possible and, and keep our operations working smoothly. Thank you very much, Ms. Michael, for a, a very comprehensive, very clearly laid out uh, report. And, and thank you to um, all of your team that, that helped you put this together. So um, I'd like to open this up for questions from board members at this point. And I'm going to have to scroll up and down on my uh, set of windows to make sure I don't miss anybody. All right, I'm not seeing any hands up at this point.
All right. Um, I will simply say thank you. Uh, I asked a number of, uh, of questions in email that uh, you addressed as you were going through tonight as well. So um, I won't rehash them here, but um, the action that you are seeking for us coming up in September would be to the reallocation of some of those re the remaining funds um, out of that $1.4 million um, fund balance, well, it's not really a fund balance, but remaining uh, unspent funds out of the current year budget um, in, in our September 8th meeting. Is that correct? Correct. So we would represent for the board a motion asking you if we could make the budget transfers to allocate the funding to the places we need to spend it from. Um, and we would also at the same time bring to you the request for us to surplus the bus that we replaced with the new bus that has arrived. Um, that was a bus that has significant maintenance costs. Um, so we would bring both of those to you in September. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any comments about that or anything else that anybody needs to have uh, addressed before we're able to, to think about that one next meeting? And I am scrolling up and down my windows. All right. Uh, and I don't know uh, then, Dr. Nunez, if there's anything that you want to want to add before we uh, before we move forward. No, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Michael and her team for pulling all of this together. It's always nice to be able to close out a budget for the year, um, and she she and her team did a great job. If you do have questions and you're thinking about them um, between now and when you do take action, final action on some of those budget adjustments, feel free to let us know because we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Mr. Reidinger. Not a, not a quick question, and, and it may in fact be <clears throat> not possible, but one of the things I'm thinking through as we look forward to the next meeting is you know, the really unknown variable is when, do, when, we are, when are we able to bring back most of the kids to school? Um, and so I'm just sort of wondering <clears throat> what the effect on expenditures and revenue is going to be based on those different assumptions. So, you know, if certainly there will be on the community services in the food services fund, right? There will be a fall off in revenue for as long as kids aren't in the school. And, you know, I, I, I just would like to have a picture if it's possible about you know, what these transfers are designed to assume and what might also be necessary um, so that I'm, I'm, I make sure that as, as a board member, we're allocating the funds in the best way. And you, I don't wanna, in some cases you don't wanna spend $100,000 now, even if it's valuable in the long term, if you're gonna need that $100,000 in two months. So I think it would be sort of, you know, useful to understand what the risks, what the spectrum of risks are um, in terms of revenue uh, based on different assumptions about when kids are able to return to school. Absolutely. I would be happy to put something together that I can share with the board at the next meeting that really looks both at our projected um, revenue impacts and also our projected expenditure impacts. Thank you, Mr. Reininger, and thank you, Ms. Michael. Uh, and uh, I see Ms. Downs. Thank you, Ms. Michael, for your thorough presentation as always. Uh, just a quick question, um, and I apologize if I missed this, but on the one-time funding uh, list, there's a couple uh, such as the van and the psychologist intern and the Mount Daniel furniture that are listed as pending. Uh, I'm sorry if I just missed it. What does that mean exactly? I didn't say. <laughs> so what we did in both of those, <laughs> what we did in both of those cases, we we asked them to put their order on hold, right? It wasn't something that we felt was urgent while students were out, and we really wanted to make sure that we ended FY twenty in a comfortable place, and that the board still felt comfortable about moving forward with these actions. So in both of those cases, they know exactly what they want. Um, but we've asked them to hold off on placing the order because it, just as Mr. Reitinger indicated, we want to make sure that that's the best use of this funding. Yeah, thank you. I think that's very prudent. And I, I believe I even asked that question when we started going down the road of COVID and, and remembering this list and hoping that we could put the brakes on some of that for now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Uh, Mr. Webb, I see you are off mute. 
Yes. Um, quick question about the hold harmless. Is that something that we're asking and talking to the, um, the legislature is going to be looking at for the upcoming January session? Is that something that the legislative um, should be a priority within our legislative package as we start potentially starting to think about those type of things? So, Mr. Anderson, I don't know if you want to yeah, I was take a stab at that. I, I do think it would be, I, I do think there's been some conversation early um, with Marcus Simon and with the six ass law. Um, but I, I, I don't see that there would be any reason not to make it part of the legislative package or to do some early advocacy um, through the legislative liaison, just as a thought. Yeah, I was going to build on on that question. That was similar to the thought I was uh, driving at earlier, Mr. Webb. I think for me, it's sort of both. I don't know that they're going to be doing anything on this in the current session, of course, because th that's a pretty targeted session. But there isn't any reason, I don't think, that if, if it were the board's desire to have some kind of communication, a letter, or you know, some kind of contact through the legislative, through our liaison, um, to reach out to our local uh, legislators at this point, and then again to put it into the package for the upcoming uh, upcoming session, if that's what the board um, wants to wants to go for. Perhaps this is a um, a topic we should take up at our uh, at our meeting on the eighth to give a little bit more formal thought to that. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, I definitely think it's something that we should probably have a little bit more formal conversation about on the eighth. Uh, because it's, I would think at least starting to lay the foundation now with uh, Senator Saslaw and Delegate Simon to let them know this is something that we're working on and coming down the down the pipeline for the January session. Um, but I think uh, this is going to be very important uh, topic for us. That's a pretty significant hit that we would take if uh, if that does not um, get put into place for us. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, other questions? Uh, otherwise, I have something building on what Mr. Reitinger asked, but um, other questions or comments on this? Uh, not seeing any, I guess I'll, I'll ask. And it's not a question that ha has an immediate answer. It's not a question that is a short term. This is a longer term question for me. Building on what Mr. Writing was talking about, different scenarios for, for what the future looks like. I'm curious how this is impacting the budget planning for the coming year and what sort of range of options is given thought to that, how to handle that situation. You seem to have been specializing in the past few months of um, having to sort of go in multiple scenarios all at the same time. And so I don't know that I, I need a detailed answer at this point, but just any sort of thoughts along those lines. I, I, I will just say that it is gonna, it already has an impact of us uh, for us thinking forward. Um, you know, we have um, committed to our employees that any extra revenue would go towards compensation, but unfortunately, it's not looking like we're going to have extra revenue. Um, but what we are doing, um, just in preparation, as Ms. Michael indicated, as we are um, currently, we we've, we've frozen most hiring um, at this point. Um, we are looking at where there is a reduction in students, um, there may be a need to um, level out, kind of like we did a couple of years ago, to kind of right size the teaching staff uh, for the students that we have and the like. So I think I think it's all going to have an impact going forward. So we're we're already thinking about it. Miss Michael, do you want to add to that? Um, following up on the conversation from earlier, we were also having detailed conversations today about our enrollment projections for next year. Um, we too are very concerned that the data that we send to Weldon Cooper is as of September 30th. And we will, when we look at this current year, just looking at our kindergarten enrollment, for example, you know, that enrollment is significantly below what we've had in the past. And if you'll remember, just as recently as last year, they were projecting we would be over 200, right? So the question is, when we look at that, will those children return, as Dr. Noonan indicated, if they're in a private school this year, will they return next year? Um, will families have held their children back for a year? I, I think the projections really have a significant impact that we've already been thinking about in terms of how do we help ensure that we're getting the best possible data from Weldon Cooper in this really unprecedented circumstance. It, it may actually behoove us at some point, you know, not to um, 
not to spend a lot of money, but if there were someone who could actually come in and help us in a, from a position of a demographer in some ways, um, to add value to what Welding Cooper gives us, particularly in this circumstance, it might be money down the line well spent to actually save some money um, by, by knowing exactly who, who we have, where they live, and, and whether or not they're coming. So maybe something to think about. Uh, I see Mr. Reitinger has a hand up. And you're on mute, Mr. Reitinger. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. In, in response to um, Dr. Noonan, and I think that does make some sense. I might suggest that you talk to the city manager because those same costs and effects are going to apply generally in the city. And I think the economic, you know, the the economic future of Falls Church City is going to be. Um, I mean, the 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 small changes in assumptions about how about the pandemic are going to dwarf any standard deviation in terms of other changes, right? So um, I think trying to get a little bit smarter and thinking about what the different options are and what we foresee happening would probably be money very well spent. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Um, and, and I was just about to, to say pretty much exactly that. So I agree with you completely. I think the, to the degree that coordinating with the city is possible on this one, given that the demographic effects we're talking about ripple through everything in the city, I think is it, it's really wise to, to go after that. So thank you for that comment, Mr. Reitinger. Uh, any other final thoughts on this item? Any other questions anyone wants to have here? All right, not seeing any. Again, thank you, Ms. Michael, and thank you to your whole team for the, the great effort that went into this report and all of the good information contained in it. And we'll look forward to further conversation on the 8th. So thank you. Um, so at this point, we are now gonna be uh, moving forward out of our business and action item into um, a closed meeting that I suspect will be a, a rather longer closed meeting than some of our other ones. Uh, and then following that, we would really have only the action of, of coming out into open and certifying uh, the meeting and then, then moving on to adjourn. So um, at this point, unless anybody has any questions, I, I would be uh, entertaining a motion related to a closed meeting. That's what I'm looking to see. Uh, so at this point, if anyone wants to make a motion, I see Ms. Downs. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I'd like to move that pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose to discuss or consider the identified subject matter personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular, superintendent's evaluation and discussion of the award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds, including interviews of bidders, or offerers and discussion of terms or scope of such contract, which discussion in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-37118A29, in particular, a contract for school renaming consultant. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Uh, yes, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. And Mr. Webb. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for our closed session. Um, I would uh, seek a motion uh, uh, reconvening us in open. Mr. Chair, move that we reconvene in open. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, Dr. Noonan, will you call the roll on that one? I will. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Ms. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Linton? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. 
All right, thanks. We have uh, reconvened to open session and now I would seek a motion certifying the closed meeting. Dr. Dimmick. Whereas the City of Falls Church School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and whereas section 2.2-377B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge only public, public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convened the close convening the closed meeting were heard discussed or considered. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, I would just note quickly for the record, just the code section 2.2-3711 uh, B, just to make sure that we get the motion there. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Noonan, will you call the roll, please? I will. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Reidinger? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And um, with that, I believe we have completed everything on the agenda tonight and uh, we stand adjourned. Can you tell me who read us out of closed? Uh, that was uh, that was Dr. Dimmick. Okay. And who 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 did the reconvene? Who moved that one? Uh, that was Mr. Webb. Okay, got it. And second? Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Okay, got it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Lost myself there for a second. No worries. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. We are adjourned.